Hello everyone, welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. In our last class, we discussed the difference between criticality limits and criticality controls, and we differentiated between passive, active, and administrative control mechanisms. The ANSI ANS 8.1 standard states that, before a new operation with fissile material can begin, or before an existing operation is changed, it shall be determined that the entire process will be subcritical under both normal and credible upset conditions. We'll discuss what constitutes a credible upset condition in a little bit, but today we're going to discuss how criticality safety engineers can apply these control mechanisms to comply with the 8.1 standard and ensure that operations remain subcritical. We'll discuss what controls we can establish, how we know that they're working, and what features we'd like our controls to have. So let's begin with this last point. Assuming that we're designing criticality safety controls, what features do we want them to have? First, we want controls to be simple and easy to follow. If they're not simple, or if they require intense thought and concentration to follow, or they are inconvenient, then it's not likely that operations will comply with these controls. After all, Operations has a job to do, and why are they going to follow some rule that prevents them from doing their job? Therefore, our goal when designing criticality controls is always to make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. If the safe way to do things also happens to be the path of least resistance, then workers are very likely to do things that way. Next, we should work extensively with operations when we design criticality controls. After all, they're the ones who are going to have to comply with the controls that we implement, and any controls that significantly obstruct operations are likely to be circumvented. Furthermore, operations staff probably know the facility a lot better than we do, and often they can offer helpful suggestions when we're trying to figure out how to implement specific controls. One example, which is actually a real example that has taken place, is if we're trying to maintain moderation control in a certain room, and we're worried that overhead fire suppression water lines could break and flood the room with water. Operations staff might know that these fire sprinklers were installed to prevent combustibles from burning during a previous operation in this room, and that the room no longer contains any combustibles. Therefore, we can achieve moderation control by cutting and capping the fire suppression water lines since this room no longer requires a fire suppression system. After we finish working with operations and develop our criticality safety controls, we can refer to the ANS ANSI standards to figure out how to verify and inspect these controls to prove that they remain functional over time. We'll discuss this more in a later lecture, but it's worth noting that the ANSI ANS standards do not require us to create postings for administrative controls. These controls can instead be emphasized through training, reminders, or regular walkthroughs. Again, having too many postings means that it's more likely for any one administrative limit to be ignored. So now that we've spent some time discussing how to design our controls in general, now we'll discuss what specific criticality parameters we want to control. Different sites might have different lists of physical control parameters, but the MAGIC MERV acronym does a good job of summarizing the different physical control parameters that we need to consider for an operation. Again, MAGIC MERV stands for Mass, Absorption, Geometry, Interaction or Spacing, Concentration or Density, Moderation, Enrichment or Assay, Reflection, and Volume. I've also listed which part of the Boltzmann transport equation each parameter affects and how increasing each parameter will impact K effective. So now we'll briefly discuss how to develop controls for each of these parameters. We're not going to go through this list in order, but we will start off with the first one, mass control. Mass control seeks to control the mass of fissile material present, and we can usually accomplish mass control through geometry or volume control. After all, if our material has a relatively known density, then we should be able to estimate what volumes and containers would accommodate an unsafe amount of fissile material. ANSI ANS 8.1 provides a list of mass limits for systems containing pure uranium-233, uranium-235, or plutonium-239. But these single parameter limits aren't always that helpful because they assume that we have one region of pure fissile material. An operation could easily process much more fissile material than this if, for example, it used low enrichment uranium that was formed into small pellets divided amongst a large number of smaller containers. These limits are helpful for one-off situations when a mass of material needs to be stored somewhere, 
but in practice, these limits tend to be overly restrictive for physical material operations. Instead, it might be more helpful to use multi-parameter critical mass limits. The critical mass curves that we've discussed several times in this course are one example of a multi-parameter mass limit. Many of these critical mass curves were taken from the Los Alamos document LA10860MS, and this document provides multi-parameter critical mass dimensions for systems containing different concentrations of uranium-235, uranium-233, or plutonium-239. In truth, modern analyses generally use codes like MCMP or SCALE to determine what conditions result in a critical configuration and what is the subcritical limit. It's important to distinguish between subcritical limits, the limit beyond which we cannot guarantee that the system will be subcritical, and safety limits. Safety limits must also account for any credible upset conditions and contingencies. For example, an accidental double batching could cause a container to hold twice as much material as intended. Documents like TID 7016 provide helpful safety factors to scale down subcritical limits to account for human error. For example, if we use MCMP simulations to estimate the subcritical mass limit for uranium powder that's being stored in a geometrically unfavorable container, then TID 7016 would recommend reducing the mass of powder in that container to a factor of 1 divided by 2.3 times that subcritical limit. This particular safety factor, 1 divided by 2.3, ensures that the system will remain subcritical in case someone accidentally double batches this container. Volume control is one of the most common criticality controls, and it prevents unsafe conditions by limiting the volume of fissile material that can enter some container or some space. In general, it's usually easier to limit the volume of material present than it is to limit the mass of material, and thus we can usually accomplish mass control indirectly through volume control. Geometrically favorable containers are one common example of volume control, but since the critical mass depends on the concentration, enrichment, moderation, and a ton of other factors, the exact size of geometrically favorable containers is almost always situation dependent. When designing geometrically favorable containers, it's usually best to design them for the most reactive concentration, density, or enrichment in the facility. This way, our containers will still prevent criticality if someone accidentally places the wrong kind of fissile solution in the container. In practice, this can be very limiting for operations, since one high-density operation could force the entire facility to use very small containers. In scenarios like this, it might be best to design a material accountability program so that it is not credible for the high-density solution to show up in the same area as low-density solutions. Placing the high-density or high-enrichment operations in a completely separate building is one possible way to accomplish this. If it's not possible to separate different densities or different enrichments in different buildings, then we can perhaps use administrative controls, such as posted warnings, to contain materials of different densities or enrichments. Next, we'll discuss composition, concentration, or density control. Concentration control can be very difficult in practice because it's difficult to know the density of fission material in solutions. Something that we think is low-density uranium might look exactly like high-density uranium, and we might not know until it's too late. Things like color-coded containers can help ensure composition control, but in practice, it's better to design safety limits or the size of geometrically favorable containers for the most reactive concentration that is credible to appear in that container. Enrichment or assay control is similar to concentration control because it's difficult to know the enrichment of some material just by a quick inspection. Therefore, it's usually best to design our safety limits using the highest enrichment of material that is credible to be present, or to design a material segregation and accountability program that is rigorous enough to ensure that it's not credible for a high enrichment material to show up in a low enrichment operations area. It's also worth noting the difference between enrichment and assay. The term assay is generally applied to plutonium-containing materials, and a material's assay is essentially the opposite of enrichment. High enrichment uranium could contain mostly U-235, while high assay plutonium would contain mostly non-fissile plutonium-240. Moderation control involves limiting the amount of moderation present near fissile material. 
the amount of moderator present could be quantified using mass to volume ratios, fractional content, or the H to X ratio, which is the ratio of hydrogen atoms to X, where X is the number of fissile isotopes present. Again, our goal with moderation control is to limit the amount of moderator present around our fissile material. Accomplishing moderation control can make firefighting very difficult, and so if we want to fight fires without introducing a new moderator, we might consider moving our fire suppression system to a halogen or halon system, which is generally very expensive and potentially harmful to any people who might be present. Or, we could consider eliminating all combustibles from the area so that a fire suppression system isn't necessary. Alternatively, we could accomplish moderation control by controlling the mass of moderator that can be present around our fissile material. We might design our geometrically favorable containers so that they can't hold enough moderator to approach optimally moderated conditions. Or, we might install drainage systems to ensure that rooms containing fissile material cannot flood or fill up with water in case the fire sprinklers go off or a water line breaks. We've already discussed absorption control to a degree when we discussed the Boltzmann transport equation several lectures ago. But to recap, absorption control is difficult to achieve in practice because you need to guarantee that the absorber remains present and that it always serves its intended purpose. Absorption control is difficult in spent fuel pools where it might not be feasible to ensure that the aluminum clad boron containing boroplates or boroflex plates remain intact. Boroflex is subject to chemical decomposition, while boral plates are subject to corrosion and crumbling. And because of their aluminum cladding, we might not be able to see if these plates have decomposed and crumbled away from the top segments of the spent fuel, which, as it happens, contains the most reactivity. Furthermore, absorption control generally does not work for fast systems, since absorbers usually just increase reactivity by acting as reflectors. But on the flip side, you could achieve some degree of absorption control for fast systems by combining neutron absorbing materials with neutron moderating materials, which would moderate the fast neutrons to the point where the absorbers are effective. Reflector control involves controlling the amount of reflector present around fissile material. Just like mass control, we can use multi-parameter critical mass curves to estimate the subcritical limit for a system that could potentially be surrounded by a certain thickness of a reflector material. When aiming for reflector control, it's important to remember that people are excellent neutron reflectors. An emergency evacuation plan that moves people through an area with fissile material could introduce an unexpected amount of reactivity, as could people standing around the water cooler near fissile material or standing around the material for a tour. The floor is a neutron reflector too, so any event that knocks material off of a shelf and onto the floor could provide an unexpected reactivity insertion. Geometrically favorable containers are a common example of geometry and volume control, but it's also important to guard against events that could change the shape of a material in any unfavorable way. Events that squish or deform fissile material containers tend to increase their surface to volume ratios and thus are likely to increase a system's neutron leakage. But we must still guard against any changes to a container's geometry that could add reactivity to our system, such as someone accidentally replacing a long, skinny 2.5 liter container with a less leaky square-shaped 2.5 liter container. Separation and interaction control involves maintaining a safe degree of separation between fissile materials and or limiting neutron interaction between fissile materials. The likely degree of neutron interaction is often a factor when designing geometrically favorable containers, since a geometrically favorable container may no longer be geometrically favorable when it falls off a shelf and rolls next to another container holding the same material. We can prevent interaction between different containers by, for example, bolting material shelves or racks to the floor to prevent containers from spilling out during an earthquake, or by placing bird cages around fissile material containers to make sure that the containers can't roll directly next to each other or that they can't be stacked right on top of each other. Neutron interaction is a complex, multifaceted problem because of the wide variety of possible container spacings, the variety in the potential degree of moderation present, and other potential upset conditions. Therefore, we must generally use high-fidelity codes like MCMP to determine subcritical limits for different interaction upset conditions.
Now, even though these simulations are very high fidelity and generally very accurate, it's important to make sure that we don't make simplifications to these computational models that underestimate the amount of reactivity introduced by an upset condition. From our background in reactor physics, we can recall that the eigenvalue of a homogeneous mixture of fuel and moderator is lower than that of a heterogeneous mixture. This is because neutrons are more likely to thermalize without being absorbed by capture resonances if the moderator is physically separated from the fuel. So assuming that water from a fire suppression system mixes uniformly with highly enriched uranium oxide powder in some container, will actually underestimate the amount of reactivity that this water introduces. So to recap, criticality safety engineers must control for the mass and volume of fissile material, whose limits depend on the enrichment or assay of that material, and on the possible geometry and shape of fissile material containers, and the degree of moderation present. However, what geometry is favorable also depends on how likely neutrons are from different containers to interact, which also depends on the degree of reflection present, the neutron moderation, and if there are any absorbers in place. All of this also depends on the concentration and density of the fissile material, and whether the material is mixed homogeneously with itself and with any other possible moderation. Whew! So as you can probably guess, nuclear criticality safety is a complex, multifaceted problem because of how interactive and how interrelated the limiting parameters are. We will generally need to control multiple parameters to maintain criticality safety. Ideally, we can minimize this number of controlled parameters to only a few, but the MAGIC MERV acronym provides us with a good roadmap and a good list of parameters to consider controlling. We'll discuss this more when we discuss criticality safety evaluations, or CSEs, but CSEs might require that we list through the MAGIC MERV parameters and discuss how we are controlling for each parameter or why controlling for that parameter is not necessary. In the next lecture, we'll discuss how process analysis allows us to determine what are the credible upset conditions around which we must define our subcritical limits.